Good afternoon, and thank you very much for the opportunity to present this talk on stem cell based therapies for ovarian regeneration. I'm Professor Carolyn Eastler, I'm the Chief Scientific Officer at Next Biosciences and also an Associate Professor of Biochemistry at the University of KwaZulu Natal and Academic Leader of Biotechnology in the School of Life Sciences at UKZN. For the remainder of the presentation, I'm going to switch my video off just to save a little bit on bandwidth, um, and then I'll switch back on right at the end. So maybe just before we get going with the next slide to establish that the definition of regeneration or the term regeneration refers to the process of replacing or restoring damaged or missing cells or tissues or organs. Now, infertility we know affects uh, many couples, uh, many as one in six couples, and the causes um, of infertility can be both on the male or the female side, or indeed on both. In women, the underlying reasons for infertility can include, but are not limited to, firstly, an inability of the fertilized egg to implant in the endometrial layer of the uterine wall. So this is, for instance, seen in Asherman syndrome, due to a thin or a scarred endometrium. However, a second cause could be the lack of sufficient oocytes due to a poor or diminished ovarian reserve. This can result from environmental factors, an increasing age, the presence of disease, and even can be caused by genetics. The number of women that demonstrate a poor or diminished ovarian reserve is in fact increasing, and as such, almost one fifth of cases of infertility in women are actually attributed to this. So stem cells have shown some promise in treating both male and female infertility, in terms of female infertility, studies suggest that they can promote both endometrial and ovarian regeneration. In the case of a dysfunctional endometrium, stem cells have shown promise in pre promoting endometrial thickness and also function. And with respect to ovarian dysfunction, the stem cells have been shown um, to be able to promote the development of follicles in the ovary and also stimulate the production of competent oocytes. So for the remainder of the talk, I'm going to be focusing on poor ovarian reserve. So poor ovarian reserve indicates a reduction in the quantity of ovarian follicles in women of reproductive. One would, uh, um, one would see a normal count to be approximately 10 to 12 uh, follicles per ovary per month with a number of one to 10 uh, being considered low. So on the right hand side, you can see uh, an image showing you the uterus, um, the uh, fallopian tube, and then the ovary. And you can see within the ovary, uh, the follicles develop from primary follicles to secondary, which are the antral follicles, and then finally to the pre-ovulatory follicles from which the um, oocyte is then released into the fallopian tube. And there are numerous hormones that regulate this. And one of the hormones that one can use to, um, to determine the state of the um, ovarian reserve is the antimalarian hormone. So the antimalarian hormone uh, levels give you an idea of um, the size of the ovarian reserve. AMH is produced by future generations of follicles, not those in your current cycle. And so it's a good indicator of this reserve. What needs to be remembered is that AMH levels naturally decrease with age. So for example, a 35 year old would have half the levels approximately of AMH compared to a 25 year old woman. And a 45 year old will have even less roughly a third of what a 35 year old woman would have had. And so this needs to be kept in mind when we're looking at using AMH as an indicator of ovarian reserve. So the regenerative effects of stem cells in the ovarian niche, and that would be this environment that the follicle finds itself in, um, includes the ability of these stem cells, once they're injected, to promote the development of the follicles and indeed decrease the number of follicles that would die before being able to successfully release the oocyte. 
So stem cells are thought to do this by making the environment in the ovary less inflammatory. Um, this translates to a, a less aggressive environment and one that is less likely to cause the follicles to die. So if this ovarian environment is improved, and this could be in cases where um, we are dealing with an aged environment or perhaps ovaries are damaged, then possibly competent oocytes could be produced by the ovary for the purposes of IVF. So that is indeed what one is trying to achieve with um, the application of stem cells. So I'm sure you all have heard of stem cells and, um, and are familiar with them. And what I'd like to do in, in this slide is really just recapitulate the definition of a stem cell and possibly go into a little bit of the types of stem cells that one finds. And so a stem cell is considered an unspecialized cell. The cell is able to uh, self renew. What that means is that it can retain its population over a long period of time. And this usually refers to the um, lifespan of the organism or the individual. It's also able to differentiate or maybe um, it, uh, put more clearly change into a specialized cell. So a stem cell can, for instance, become um, a blood cell, like a red blood cell that has a particular function. Its function of the red blood cell would be to carry oxygen. It can become a, a white blood cell, and the function of that cell would be to fight infections, or it could differentiate into a muscle cell, um, which would have a function of contracting and providing the organism with the ability to move, for instance, or a heart and the ability to contract. So you may have heard of embryonic stem cells, and it's important to just define when we talk about stem cells and we talk about clinical trials, which ones are we generally referring to? So embryonic stem cells are those stem cells that are found in the embryo and specifically in the blastocyst stage, really within the first five days. Right? So these inner cell mass cells, which are your embryonic stem cells, are the cells that go and give rise to all the tissue that make up your body. So all the germ layers, whether that is ectoderm, which would give rise to, for instance, your skin, um, or it could be mesoderm or endoderm, every single tissue that makes up your body as you sit and listen to this talk um, was uh, derived from cells from this inner cell mass. So most clinical trials don't really focus on embryonic stem cells, and the reason for that is because it's actually twofold. The first is that there, there's an ethical complication of using embryonic stem cells because when you isolate them, you have to destroy the embryo and that um, uh, is not uh, deemed uh, always as being ethically acceptable. And secondly, embryonic stem cells are um, known to have a very high potency. They can give rise to any tissue of the body. And so um, the fear is then that um, this could bring with it also the propensity to be able to result in tumors. So rather, most clinical trials, the majority of the clinical trials that have been published and carried out have actually focused on adult stem cells. So adult stem cells are those stem cells that are found in the body postnatally. So after the baby is born um, or around the time of birth and from then on, those stem cells are found in various tissues around the body, like in the muscle, in the bone, in the fat, in the brain, in the skin, et cetera. And the function of these stem cells is really um, more of a maintenance a function and also a regenerative function. They're there to ensure that the tissues in the human body, in this case, can main be maintained and can continue to function for the lifespan of that individual. So, so um, if we then move on and we look at these adult stem cells, and, and they're referred to as multipotent rather than pluripotent, because they do give rise to different tissues, but it's more restricted, and therefore they have a lower uh, chance, or thought to have a lower chance of, of um, giving rise to something like a, a tumor, okay, because they're a little bit more directed in what they're going to produce. So we can, we can then also look at adult stem cells in different classes. There are two major ones, which would be your hematopoietic and your mesenchymal. So your hematopoietic stem cells are those that give rise to all the blood cells. So the red blood cells as shown in here, but also your white blood cells for your um, immunity, so the immune responses, 
and then also the cells that give rise to platelets. And then the mesenchymal stem cells um, would be those cells that give rise to, for instance, connective tissue like fat tissue, or bone, or muscle. Uh, you can also find mesenchymal stem cells in the bone marrow. You can find them in the cord blood, in the cord tissue, and also in placental tissue. So the, um, uh, the great thing about stem cells is that they have this um, accepted ability to, to help tissues regenerate. And they do this by producing proteins called cytokines and growth factors. Uh, they also produce other molecules. And, and together, these molecules um, can make the environment into which they are introduced less inflammatory. And so, of course, that could be beneficial if you're thinking about the ovarian environment and you try to create a permissive environment for these follicles to develop successfully. There have been a number of clinical trials um, and also case studies involving individual patients where stem cells have been utilized to see whether they can assist patients with a poor ovarian reserve. And I thought it would be a good idea just to describe the general approach in these studies. So this slide shows that if we start here from adipose tissue, the stem cells can be isolated from this adipose or fat tissue. This could also be bone marrow, for instance, or it can be another uh, source of mesenchymal stem cells. And once they are isolated, they can then be transplanted into um, the uh, ovary, and that is usually done laparoscopically or transvaginally. And so that would be transplanted into one or both ovaries. And the hope is then that these cells will make the environment in the ovary such that follicles can develop and competent oocytes can be produced. So I want to now just focus on the next few slides on uh, uh, some of the trials and case studies that have been carried out. Bone marrow derived stem cells first. The Gupta case study was looking at assisting a single individual. This is a 45 year old female. Um, and the uh, bone marrow derived mesenchymal stem cells were injected into each ovary, so into both ovaries. So, keeping in mind this is a single case study, um, it was found that within eight weeks there were additional follicles found and the AMH levels had increased. Um, and following assisted reproduction, a successful pregnancy was indeed achieved. And this was really good news. The ASPA trial is a clinical trial that was registered and included 15 patients. These were all under the age of 40, and the trial used bone marrow-derived stem cells, and this was transplanted into one ovary by the ovarian artery. Uh, here they found that two weeks post-treatment, more than 80% of the patients showed an increase in the antral follicle count. Ultimately, five pregnancies were achieved and three babies were born. So this was a great outcome. The treatment evidently increased the quantity of follicles that could then be utilized um, uh, in terms of um, IVF treatment. What we must remember is the quantity was affected, but the quality um, was unaffected. So the euploidy rate, the percentage of um, embryos was normal chromosomal makeup remained the same. In a very recent study, adipose derived stem cells were investigated for their safety and their ability to promote regeneration in nine women with premature. So the stem cells were isolated from adipose tissue um, in these, uh, from this, these women and then cultured to increase their numbers so that one could um, Three women, five million cells, to, to another three would be 10 million cells, and to the final three, they received 15 million cells. These cells were um, applied either transvaginally um, or laparoscopically. And this was um, into a single ovary. And so what was found here was that um, the researchers found that intra-ovarian transplantation of adipose derived stem cells is in fact safe with um, was no significant uh, serious adverse, event, adverse events found. And interestingly, out of the nine patients, four resumed menstruation. So to summarize, the trials and the case studies done to date 
have indicated that bone marrow and adipose derived stem cells are safe for intraovarian treatment of female infertility, but it must be stated that this is not currently available as an accepted treatment for infertility. However, they, the results are really encouraging. AMH levels have been shown to be increased. Follicular counts have been positively affected. Pregnancy has been observed in certain instances. Um, however, no effect on aneuploidy rate. So again, an effect on quantity, but not quality. And then just finally, the first South African phase one clinical trial is now complete. This included uh, 30 women with premature ovarian failure and utilized adipose derived stem cells um, to determine uh, similar um, endpoints and as in previous trials. This was a collaboration between the BioArt Fertility Clinic, Next Biosciences, UKZN, and the Durban University of Technology. And the results for this trial are currently being written up as a scientific paper and will be published in the near future. And we look forward to sharing that with the public. Thank you very much.